Um, are the speakers ready? Oh, yes, there. Okay, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Devish Wara from Korea Club, and I'll be moderating this uh, today's session of family law. We have two speakers uh, here today, amazing lawyers that have agreed uh, to give us a talk on family law. Uh, so the first speaker is Datin Yuan Raj, who is, a, uh, who is a partner in Gerald Gomez and Associates. She has been active in the legal practice in Malaysia and in Australia. Uh, Datin Yuan divides her time between her practices in Malaysia and in Australia, uh, where she concentrates on family law, mediation, uh, and migration and assisting Malaysian clients having business and family interests in Australia. Uh, thankfully, uh, thankfully for us, Datin will be providing uh, insights not only on Malaysian law, but also on uh, Australian law. Datin practices family law and corporate law in both jurisdictions. Uh, she's here to help us explore various possibilities on how our career path can develop. On the other hand, we have Mr. Gan Chong Chia, is, who is a partner in Ma Wing Kai and Associates. Mr. Gan continues his practice in Ma Wing Kai and Associates in the areas of general litigation, wills, probate, debt recovery, uh, corporation, family law, and even criminal law. Mr. Gan has even written an article named Wills in Malaysia for the firm. It's an amazing read and, a great, uh, and great for students taking equity and trust. Year three students do pay attention. Um, so just a brief overview of um, today's event. So the total session will be about two hours, uh, inclusive of the Q&A session. We can extend it um, until 12.30 maximum if uh, needed. The session will be on Zoom, of course, uh, and it's being broadcasted on Facebook as well. Uh, we have two moderators today, Barvani and myself. Um, Barvani will be moderating the Facebook section while I will be moderating uh, the Zoom session. Anyways, without further ado, uh, to kickstart the event, I would like to invite uh, Datin Yuan, who will be giving us her insights into family law. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dave, um, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone. I can't see you. You've all got your anonymous look out there so and it's great to be here with uh, Gan it's um and I I hope that we can both give you some insight into this area that you might be interested in practicing I'm going to share my screen so just to give you a background I've been in practice for almost 30 years so I was telling Dave that I think the best way for me to share is to actually um share some stories about uh, what I've um, encountered as a lawyer, as a family lawyer, and maybe that'll help you even uh, figuring out whether this is what you want to do and whether, uh, and, and, and ask us any questions that you may have about it. So let me just start by sharing my screen and, okay. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Okay, so, well, this is the, um, uh, the, our firm does a lot of, it's a litigation firm mainly. So we do a lot of civil, criminal, um, corporate litigation, family, copyright cases, land matters. So we've done a lot of cases over the years and I've been involved in quite a number of them. And also we are very much a firm that does a lot of pro bono cases. So this is the Sagong Tasi case, which actually changed this. Uh, it was a landmark decision and it changed a lot of ideas about how land, you know, when land is taken from the Orangasi, how it is to be compensated to them. So I had, I had a chat with Dave before we started and, you know, it's not all about money. It is about a lot of other things, you know, standing up for the law, standing up for the people who can't speak for themselves. And really uh, that part of the law is also very uh, rewarding. So we have five partners in the firm. And one thing wonderful about it is we all share the same values. And that's something I would encourage you if you're thinking about going out there and starting your own firm, find people that share the same values as you. We've been in practice together 
uh, Dr. Gerald, Mr. David Peter, Ms. Sham, Michelle Wong. We've been in practice together for many, many years. And we still enjoy each other's company outside of the practice of law. And that's important for you to think about when you are actually going out in practice. And, you know, we all, like I said, we share the same values. So all of us do talks like this where it doesn't benefit us as such, but it benefits more the people whom we are serving. And that also is a part of being a lawyer, um, sharing your skills and um, that you have learned over the years with the people in your community, just making an impact in your community. So yes, I do practice in Australia as well. It's quite a different jurisdiction from here. And, uh, and I'll go a little bit into that later. Um, how practice of the law uh, is very different in, in Australia as compared to Malaysia, but you're still serving people, you know, so it's still very rewarding. So I'd like to get straight into why you're here, which is if you're considering family law, why would you do it at all? So there are lots of, and, and I know uh, Mr. Gunn will also have a lot of insight into this because he's also a family law practitioner. So one of the things I want to tell you is that you know, I've been in practice for many, many years, and I, I did not start out wanting to do law, uh, family law, like, oh, this is what I want to do. No, nope. I had no idea what I was um, going to be focusing on. I did family law. My first family law case was because, um, you know, the family law client came in. He had a, the person had a family law issue, and we were a new firm. And when you're a new firm, you take on every single thing. Every client that walks in the door, you're going to do their case no matter what. So I had no idea how to do family law. So it was a new thing for me. So though I learned family law in the LLB, I certainly didn't specialize in it. You know? And so the first question was, my goodness, how do I do this case? Do I know enough? Have I got sufficient information to actually help this client? So in every area of the law, it is the same. Do you know enough? And if you don't know enough, what do you do? Do you say, okay, I better don't do this? Or do I find out about it? Do I give it a go? And if you want to give it a go, you're not going to use your client as a guinea pig. Please don't. You have to actually arm yourselves with the information. So go out there. And that's why it's important right now when you are in, in college, actually getting to know people and making good friends because these friends are going to be in, they're going to be practicing in areas that you may not be familiar in, but you can tap on that, their skill, their knowledge. So you've got to, to have a network of friends even now when you're in college. So just because you don't know enough doesn't mean you can't get that information. So what you learn in university is just very surface level. It is so different from practice. So you've got to get that uh, practitioner knowledge, meaning find, I mean, your friends, as well as people who are practicing in this area, go and get to know them, find out, like right now, I mean, when you actually um, uh, do your pupillage, that's a good time to actually network and meet people, because uh, practitioners are out there meeting you and sharing with you get to know them because they can then help you when you are actually facing an area of law that you have absolutely no idea how do I do this how do I get precedence am I doing this right so they can be your touch point they can be the people whom you can um, find out uh, this area so like I said I began I did my first family law case not knowing this area at all, but I found out from people and I started doing it. And this case was a huge learning curve because it went all the way up to the, at that time it was the Supreme Court. And it was very, very challenging um, emotionally, I must say. Um, so, and that is the next question. Do I care enough? because you need to care enough about your clients and this applies whether it's a family law client or not, you care enough about their issues to really go the extra mile, to really put in the legwork, to find out what you need to find out in order to help them. And family law is a lot of counseling. I always have my box of tissue ready because there will be a crying session because it is extremely, extremely emotional. It's a very emotional time for your client. So you need to be able to care enough about them as a person 
in order to do your job for them as a lawyer. Because if you don't, you will not go the extra mile. If you don't, you won't be able to get a resolution for them that they want. And in family law, I think even more than many other areas, you really need to find out from your client, what do they want? What do you want at the end of the day? What is a resolution? Because you're not going to win, win 100%. This is not a win or lose. You know, you're going to win some money at the end of the day. Uh, somebody has breached a contract, so you're going to get a compensation at the end of the day. It is not that way at all. So you need to really be clear what your client wants. And this is the same for every client that walks in the door. What do they want? So that you can actually help them get that resolution. And the third skill that is crucial, crucial, I would say, um, in a family law is to learn to mediate. Sometimes your client is asking something absolutely unreasonable because they want revenge and you cannot give it for them. You cannot get it for them. And you have to dial down your client's expectations, manage their expectations so that they know at the end of the day that you are doing the best that you can to get the optimum result for them. So you need to manage your client's expectations. Um, they may not get everything that they want, but they may get enough so that they can live with it and move on in their life. Many of the times, the issues that you deal with um, involve children, involve people who may not want to be with each other anymore, but they will continue to be parents of these children. So going back to that, that first um, case that I had, you know, it was, a, it was a custody dispute. And we lost um, at the high court because the judge believed what, and it involved a lot of issues, um, abuse and all that. But we finally won at the Supreme Court. The children were returned to the mother, my client. But at the end of the day, I kept, I kept trying to focus her on the fact that the other guy, I mean, the dad, will always be their dad, you know. And today, this is now 20-something years later, the children have graduated, we remain friends. She would send me pictures of their graduation. And um, they have, she and her ex-husband can now communicate with each other in a civil manner. So your job as a lawyer is not just to get that resolution, but you must... See whether you can help them as a person. Can you help them move on with their life? So I actually, um, she was a single mom. So she became a single mom. I, I helped her to start a business, you know, co co what do you call it? Connected her with MCA. And those are things that you would want to go the extra mile with your client. And those clients become your lifelong friends. Now, with regards to this uh, mediation, this next question about am I strong enough? In, in family law, and I would say in, any, in a, any, any area of law that you're representing your client, the lawyer on the other side is not your opponent. They are actually a professional. They are also just doing their job for their client. And if you can see that, you'll actually be able to help your client's cause. If you can speak to the other side lawyer without being defensive, without trying to fight, 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 it's not fighting. It's how can I resolve this matter? How can I resolve this issue? And if you have that mindset, you'll find that you'll be able to serve your client well. So, so, um, so are you strong enough to handle these matters? Because it can be emotionally draining. My first, that family, I would go back home and not be able to sleep. I would cry because I'm thinking, how can this happen? You know, And eventually I had to learn to separate myself as a lawyer from myself as a friend to this client. So you really need to get those skills in place because you cannot serve your clients in the best way if you are too emotionally involved in the issues. So try not to get too emotionally involved in the issues, okay? So I would say, because some of the questions that I've been asked is, what, 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 what kind of advice would I give to a lawyer starting out? I would say, one, truly care about your client. 
if you care about your client, your clients will become your lifelong friends and they will, they will continue to be your clients. I'm just showing this picture because um, we have Pastor Raymond Cole's wife, that is Susanna Cole and her daughter. And we represented them in the Suhakam hearing into the disappearance of, of Pastor Raymond Cole, which was presided over by uh, Datuk Ma Wing Kwai. You know, and it was a very good result. But at the end of the day, we now have to sue the government because nothing is happening. So you really, really need to go the extra mile. And all of this is pro bono. The middle uh, uh, case is one of the first cases we had as, uh, as a law firm. It was a criminal matter. And over 30 years later, these clients are doing very well and they, they continue to be your friends. So I want to tell you that as a lawyer, really you need to care about your client. Because if you do, you will find that they too will go the extra mile with you. They will send cases your way. They will um, help you in many other areas. So you need to be aware of that. It's not all about money. <laughs> it isn't all about money. It is about serving your client. It is a calling, you know. The uh, legal profession is a calling, a very noble profession, and it is a calling. I was also asked, how do you stand out? Well, I want to tell you that you stand out by doing what is unseen. A lot of times what is reported, and, I, and our firm has got many, many cases that have been reported in the papers that have come out in the, on TV, you know. Um, but your clients and people out there don't see the hours and hours and hours of work that you have to do behind the scene. So it is not glamorous, but when you stand out by doing what is unseen, when you do what is unseen, then... Your, the results will speak for themselves because it produces results that are seen. And the other thing I want to say is take a chance and try something new. That's what I want to say for all, all of you who are going to go out there. You're not sure really, do I do family law? Do I do corporate law? Do I do litigation, civil, criminal? Uh, I'm interested in copyright. What do I do? Try it out. Don't start so quickly deciding that this is what I want to do. I want to do m &As. I'm interested in all the big, uh, you know, mergers and I want to do that. That's where the money is. You might not enjoy it. And if you're going to do this for your, it's a lifelong career for you, a lifelong calling for you, then take a chance and try something new, even if it is scary, because it is then that you actually will um, build muscles and build your character. And I also want to say that, you know, I was asked a question, what do partners notice about um, uh, lawyers or Jamie's or interns coming in. I tell you what we notice. We notice when you go the extra mile. We notice when you do things that you don't have to do. When you're help, and, and this is not just in the law. This is when you're helping your colleagues out and you don't have to. This is when you are uh, taking the time to do something that you're not called upon to do. So do your work, but also go the extra mile for your colleagues because we notice all that. We notice when you come in late. We notice when you skive. We notice when you put in the work. We notice when we give you something to do and you give it before the time or you give it late. We notice all that. These are little, little things that you need to do. And so what does that mean? That means build your character. Build your character because your character will show when you are in when you're doing the practice of law. And like I said, you, so you can be prepared, you can um, really uh, learn so much about the law, but there will also come times when you have to do things that you're unprepared for. And this, I'm going to share something that just happened very recently. Um, all these pictures are from our Facebook page because I can't go back so many years, so I thought I'd just go to the most recent ones. And um, so do everything with all your heart. Now, you will never be fully prepared, but be prepared to fully grow. Why I say this is because very recently I was asked to do a remand proceedings, and that's a criminal matter, which is not my area of practice at all. But every single one of the partners and every one of our lawyers were out that morning, and it, it came in that morning. It was an urgent matter. I think, oh my goodness, remand proceedings <laughs> to go to the law books, you know, tax our, uh, you know, criminal, uh, of course, our criminal law practitioner who is, is Dr. Gerald. I mean, that's his area of law. So I said, my goodness, I have to do this now. What do I do? 
And with that, what, 30 minutes of preparation, I went to court. And let me tell you, I have been in practice for many years, but I went into the criminal court with that, oh my, God, it was like, oh, it's, you know, that fear and trepidation, it comes upon you. But when you start, when you begin to articulate your position, the words will come. And so, especially when you're doing it, and again, this was a pro bono matter. We were helping out a friend whose son had been arrested the night before. So be prepared to do things that you're not so comfortable in, but because when you do, you will grow and you will learn. And I just wanted to end with this, which I think is really, really, really important for all of you starting out. I, as I said, I think the law is a fantastic uh, launch pad for anything, whether you're going to go and work as an in-house counsel, you're going to go into government, be a prosecutor, you know, or, or you're going to practice, uh, you know, be in private practice and whatever area of the law that you're in, enjoy each moment of your journey, you know? And I say this because I've been in practice 30 years. The people that I'm in practice with, I enjoy their company outside of the office. So be with the people you care about. Right now, some of you may be thinking, I want to start my own firm. Don't think only about somebody who can complement your skill set. Think about somebody whose values line up with your values and whom, whose company you really enjoy. Because if you cannot enjoy their company outside of the law, then it is going to be a drudgery. You know, working and... and, and it, because it's not just work. You enjoy every success. You enjoy every sorrow. You enjoy the practice of law together because you need to be um, strong for each other. So um, I would say that as a family lawyer, this is even more important because there are times, there are times when you can be really... Um, you know, distraught, well, I wouldn't say distraught, I mean, really down because maybe the case didn't go your way. But if you have people around you who can just cheer you up and say, don't worry, we'll live to fight another day. Let's go for it. Let's, you know, let's go all the way up and you can discuss this with them, then you will really, truly enjoy it. So I think those, I, I have answered the questions that have been asked. Please, please, Ask both Mr. Gan and me. We, we just love to share with you whatever we have uh, learned along the way. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Yuan. Um, so now we'll go uh, on to Mr. Gan. Uh, so Mr. Gan, could you please give us um, your perspective on uh, family law? What uh, skills you feel that are required to become a family law lawyer. All right. Thank you, Dev. Thank you, Dev. Thank you for the warm welcome just now. And thank you to the Royal Club for inviting me to give this speech. And hi, Datin Yvonne. All right. Um, just a brief intro of myself. I'm Gan, uh, one of the partners in Mawin Kwai and Associates. Uh, just a brief background of this firm. Um, Marwin Kwan Associates. Associates. Formed in, yes, Marwin Kwan Associates was formed in 1985 by Dato Marwin Kwan. Uh, I think, as most of uh, the practitioners will know, that Dato Ma was a former court of appeal judge and he is also a commissioner. Uh, and the firm is actually a full service firm, so we have uh, basically we, we are doing everything, uh, family law included. Um, I have to admit, um, family law is definitely not one of my major portfolios. It's definitely one of the more minor portfolios. Even being, um, I was doing um, mainly on some other contractual matters or disputes or even uh, corporate litigation stuff. Um, but I think like what that thing Yvonne has actually mentioned or shared with all of us, uh, a firm cannot just solely rely on, on a family law practice to grow. You need to have um, a diverse uh, practice areas to actually grow. So um, without further ado, maybe I just give my comments on my practice as a family law uh, 
practitioner or what I have done uh, in family law before. So uh, as you all know, Malaysia has a dual system. So we have the, uh, the Muslim court, which is the Sharia court and also the civil court. So for the non-Muslims, of course, um, you go to the civil courts. And of course, there are definitely a situation happens when you are stuck in between, whether it's a Sharia court or a civil court. So, okay, we wouldn't talk about the Sharia courts then now as a practitioner for on uh, going to the civil courts then. So, what skills, uh, like Dev asked, what skills are needed to be a family law uh, lawyer, practitioner? I think Datin Yvonne has uh, summed it up quite accurately. It's not about the, it's not so much about the drafting skills. I mean, over the years, after you have years of practice uh, doing all the draftings, I'm sure the, the skills, the drafting skills are definitely there. But what is, I think, a very main ingredient of being a family lawyer is that you need to have the patience, the empathy, and also you need to be sort of a counselor to your clients. Um, we have to understand that family law matters or, or clients that, that have family law issues, they're very emotional, especially when it comes to relationships. So even if, even if it's a, a partnership between, between two family members, it can also be very emotional. So as long as when the issue re, uh, revolves around two individuals who, are, who have some form of relationship, it tends to be very emotional. And they will just do everything to, to win. And that's because they, yes, that's what Nadine has mentioned, what they want is revenge. So as a family law lawyer, or even as a lawyer in general, we have to advise them what is the correct procedure. You just cannot take every word for it. So for example, if they come to you to say that, oh, I, I, I want this, I, I want everything, you have to explain to them what they can and what they can't. And it's very important as a lawyer to actually do that is because you do not want to advise them wrongly and, and putting so much expectations on them. So that you still have to manage their expectations. If you don't and you advise them wrongly or just tell them, okay, I'll do everything you want, give them that sort of expectations. So we, as lawyers, then we may face uh, a complaint to the this disciplinary board and that is the least uh, what we would want in our career. And I believe that thing, Yvonne can agree with me on that. Right. Um, so what do you, uh, what's the job scope of a family lawyer? Uh, again, um, just like any other lawyers or uh, other areas that you are practicing, you have a client coming to you, you take up the brief, uh, you advise them, you draft the course papers, uh, taking their instructions, and then uh, give them the results that they desire. But of course, uh, like I said just now, if things cannot be done, you have to tell them upfront, don't put their expectations so high. The moment they have a very high expectations and we couldn't meet it, or even the practitioners couldn't meet it, then that is the time when uh, things will fall out and they'll start putting all the blame on you. And what other skills a uh, family law practitioner would need? I would say um, you need to be able to withstand long hours of talking over the phone, even calling you at, in the middle of the night. And also uh, they will cry to you over the phone while or even meeting you. So uh, on our part as a practitioner, we have to also be, uh, be able to handle a situation like this. Um, maybe as, as a guy, it's a bit more difficult for me to actually um, to be more uh, comforting towards a, a female client per se. Um, hence, uh, I, I mean, I have to still give that, that kind of comfort to, to the lady or to the, the, the client to say that, okay, you know what, uh, things will be fine. Um, we will, we will do what is necessary. But I mean, if it's between female lawyers, perhaps it's, uh, it's easier to actually give that kind of comfort to another uh, a female client, per se. 
And what about the, uh, I was also asked uh, this question, um, what about the number of divorce cases in, in, in Malaysia? I recently did a Google search on the uh, statistics department. Um, I did not have the latest 2019 results. Uh, it, was, it will only be published, I think, in 2020. But what I have is the 2017 and 2018 results um, of statistics that the divorce rate in 2017 or cases would be 50,314. And in 2018, it was 50,356. And for the Muslim divorce rate, it was 40,000. And for non-Muslim was around 10,000. So if you are asking me whether, um, is there enough cases for everyone to go on? I believe, yes. Uh, there are definitely enough cases for everybody. Um, and again, not all firms are doing solely on family matters. They have other, other areas of uh, practice, uh, practice areas to actually cover it up. Unless you have very, uh, prominent firms, uh, which definitely, definitely you can find in town that's doing solely on family law. And also, it's, and also for, for budding lawyers coming to practice, um, I, I totally agree with uh, Datin Yvonne, we shouldn't pigeonhole ourselves in just coming to practice and just, okay, I want to do family law and nothing else. Um, I don't think it will really help uh, a lawyer, a budding lawyer to actually grow. A way to grow is to do a, a diversify of matters, a diversify of cases. Um, the reason being um, family law matters might uh, come across uh, other, other, like for example, other matters uh, or even bankruptcy matters. I can share a, a personal experience whereby uh, the husband and wife actually um, entered into a uh, joint petition. So what happened was um, the wife was not happy because uh, after a prolonged time, uh, the terms of the uh, joint petition was not uh, fulfilled by the husband. So later we found that the husband was a bankrupt and because of that, um, he couldn't have actually transferred the uh, house or the shares of the house to the, uh, to the wife. So, so what I'm trying to say is that, um, you see, in, in, even in normal family law matters, what will transpire, you will have uh, bankruptcy matters coming up. And, and because the husband couldn't uh, fulfill his role, so what happened was the wife and then took out a committal proceedings. Committal proceedings means um, there was a contempt of the court order. Hence, um, I personally um, managed to get the contempt order. And I personally uh, got to uh, visit the guy or the husband in the house and together with the police and to bring him to the prison. So, so family law just, doesn't just, just resolve, revolve around um, family matters, just divorce, going to court and then get a divorce, uh, get a decree nine side. It, it doesn't stop there. There's more to it. So, so just to pigeonhole yourself on family law, uh, it's not something that is uh, encouraged. Uh, budding lawyers should definitely, or even pupils, uh, or even pupils, I mean, training students would definitely need to do a diversified area, um, learn a lot. And others, uh, in, in other areas, to know that uh, what you can do to actually assist your client. Some of the clients that come in, uh, even for family law matters, they may, you may even touch on issues of uh, uh, wills. So for example, um, I think not many people will know that if you have a will and you remarried, the will will be invalid. You will have the will void. So see, these are issues that will come up. But when you divorce and you have a will and you divorce, the will doesn't void the will is still valid so you have situation like this where you have other laws to actually uh, complement um, the family law so so to 
all the students who intend to do family law try other areas of law instead of just focusing on one. So how can students or even fresh lawyers actually stand up among the crowd? I think um, for this firm, for Margaret Associates, I, I, I believe um, uh, two things. I believe um, if you have uh, during breaks, do attachments, do internships. I think that actually helps. Um, if you start early, you definitely would have some form of uh, knowledge as to the workings in a law firm. Uh, if, if you have a very good seniors, they may actually guide you. Even in very uh, simple drafting, at least you have some form of experience there. The next thing I think, uh, what is very important uh, for law firms or actually loans, what they are actually looking for now would be um, students with uh, language competency, foreign language competency. So um, as we all know, uh, China, is, uh, China is now flexing their muscles and they have a lot of clients, uh, good pay masters also. So that's one of, one of the areas where because uh, the Chinese language is, is very important and I think some of the firms are actually looking for that. The other area uh, which I think law firm is looking for would be uh, IT, the IT skills, um, as you can see how the pandemic has really caused all of us to, or most of us to work from home. And I think having these IT skills is very important. And, and now mo most of the firms or even the uh, big firms, they are moving slowly towards um, having all their uh, documents uh, stored in the server or the drive and they're going paperless. I think having that skill is also very important. So um, my last words for everyone would be, try um, not to just uh, compartmentalize into one area, try everything. So uh, as you go along the years and you realize uh, where exactly then you can focus, then you can actually start focusing. But uh, starting out, uh, don't ever do that. Yeah, that's my, that's my thought on family law. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Gunn. Um, so uh, guys, you can start um, asking questions. All right, so while they type in, I actually have a question myself. Yes. Uh, that's open for both uh, both of you. So we, there's been, I mean, we've seen the law evolving. Um, in the beginning, we had trials, uh, and then we had ADR. And now there's something called ODR, online dispute resolution. And there's been a lot of hype around um, technology and AI. And it seems like there's a push for a sort of loyalist future, especially now during the uh, pandemic. I would, I don't think Malaysia has adopted it yet, but I think it's prevalent in uh, first world nations um, where for lower uh, level claims, uh, people use the online courts instead where they don't even need uh, lawyers to uh, take on their case. They just need a judge. They fill up a few um, forms and all that, and then the uh, judge will maintain the case. So in that regards, um, based on both of your experiences, um, is technology really um, uh, a problem uh, that uh, something uh, that you would consider that might uh, take our jobs, I guess you could say, or is it something that you don't really see creeping up yet? I think maybe, maybe should I, can I take first this question? Yeah, okay. Yep. All right. Um, I think technology, um, technology is definitely uh, creeping up uh, even for practice for law practice. Um, if you have been through the news, even the uh, courts in Malaysia, they are using uh, technology to actually uh, improve their hearing, uh, hearing procedure or even their hearing system. So even like, for example, the Court of Appeal now, uh, even if you attend the hearing, they are going paperless. Everything is known by called the e-appellate. So even during MCO now, um, we can still conduct our hearings um, via Zoom or even uh, whatever mode of Skype or whatever mode that uh, fits uh, or 
record ones. So we can still do that. So definitely the technology is creeping up and why technology is also important for practice is because for example, research with uh, technology, it's easier to do your research compared to books where you have to uh, make your research through books. So sometimes that will take up a lot of time. So in a way, technology helps the practice uh, in saving time. So if you have shorter research time, then you can actually spend more time doing something else. So um, about the AI, I think perhaps yes, um, AI is going to replace um, maybe lawyers, but I don't see that so um, near in the future for Malaysia. That's my thought. Nothing to you. Okay, thanks, Gan. Um, I have to say uh, this one. It's not an enemy, or I don't look at it as it as it's creeping up, or it's an enemy. I look at it as a friend. Uh, you know, uh, technology is our friend, and we have to learn to use it in our where whatever in whatever we are doing. It actually is helping us, and we need to recognize what is happening. As lawyers, we are often the forefront in things that are changing around us. We mustn't be the ones behind, you know? So you are so right when you say as um, law firms, what do we look out for? We look out for those with technical skills, skills in technology. Why? Because you better know what's happening out there and don't be so slow in, you know, uh, picking up things like this. I mean, being able to, you see, I can, I, I would say that technology is our friend very much so because I'm here in Malaysia but I'm still serving my clients in Australia. My clients can communicate with me. I can file my documents in court. I can uh, uh, handle any issues that come up, even though I am here in Malaysia. So it has actually expanded rather than narrowed my job scope. It has expanded my work. It has enabled, because I, as there's no way I can go back to Melbourne at this point in time, but my clients don't feel like I have left them, you know, I mean, I, we've got lawyers there, but there are some clients who just need to, they have to speak to you, they need you to do your work. So I, I say, I would say technology will never take the job of a lawyer who is ready and prepared to change with the times. If you're ready and prepared to change with what is happening around you, yeah, there will be things that you will not do eventually. I mean, imagine before having to do your presidents. Now everything is online. It has cut, it has saved us so much of time. It has saved us so much of time. So we really need to, I, I, I highly doubt, it's my two cents, I, that the technology will replace us, not just as lawyers, but the things that we do for our clients. So you need to make yourself irreplaceable, <laughs> right? So, um, so I, I think one, you have to keep up with the technology so that you get, you're used to doing things like this doing being able to communicate with your clients in many other ways that is easy for them being able to keep up with what's happening in court all of that is important so no i doubt it will take our jobs but we need to move with the times yeah all right thank you for that um so we have a question by navita uh, she says good morning i am a year two student as a law student studying for family law whatever we learn right now is it applicable to our future in this pathway or is it completely different from what we have studied? So to summarize the question, I believe she's asking if what she's studying right now is relevant in regards to family law. Yes, I, um, this is my thoughts. Um, definitely it's relevant in terms of the principles, in terms of the arguments, in terms of the reasonings on how the judges, uh, maybe what you are seeing from the UK cases, those are definitely relevant in, in, in the applicability of the family law expect in Malaysia. But definitely there's uh, the laws in Malaysia will be made perhaps slightly different because uh, you have the Family Law Reform Act there. So um, in terms of the principle, the cases are still applicable and how you argue in court will, will definitely still uh, be there. Uh, be applied. So. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, just because I, I learned something now and then uh, I'm going to practice is going to be a totally different. No, it, it doesn't work that way. It, it helps. It helps to practice definitely. 
Yeah, I, I would echo that. Um, but bear in mind that it is only, uh, it's just a foundation. You will learn so much more when you actually are in your chambering, you're in practice yourself. You will learn so much more. So just look at it like a foundation. So what do you need to do? You need, there are certain basic things which are the same, whether it is Australian law, UK law, Malaysian law, which are similar. But to learn the nitty gritty of the particular jurisdiction you're practicing in, you just have to start practice. That's it. So don't worry so much about whether what you're learning is relevant. When you come out to practice, it's, it's the most important. But there are a lot of foundational things that you're learning. Do put in your time. If you don't know what a contract is, you're not going to be able to you know, practice well. Okay. Okay, so our next question is from Ting Yang. Uh, she says, hi speakers, is it okay uh, slash right to take up cases which are given by one's boss, but uh, in one's opinion, morally questionable? So I guess in maybe she's uh, saying that um, she feels like that person is already guilty. Okay. But she has to do it anyways. Okay. I think if someone feels, let's say that, that, that lawyer feels that something is not right with this client or something is not right with this case, then I believe um, you can just tell your boss and say that no, I'm not comfortably I'm not comfortable handling this matter. Uh, can you perhaps get someone because I have my own reservations about this client. But in practice, I don't really see uh, uh, lawyers actually going up to the boss and say, no, I'm not going to handle this, this matter. Um, because at the end of the day, um, being in practice, and we have to have a very practical mind that um, there's costs involved in managing a firm. If everyone starts to say, oh, I'm there's moral obligation, I shouldn't take up this matter, then technically there's, there's no case. And secondly, we are there to defend and you have a judge there to, uh, to decide. So you have to let the judge to decide, yes. But if, let's say you're not comfortable, you can just go ahead and tell your boss, say, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not comfortable with this matter. Uh, and then you can just pass the power on to someone else. Okay, so I would echo the last thing, uh, Mr. Guns, the second last thing, Mr. Guns, which is um, recognize what your role is in the administration of justice. You are not the judge. There is a judge. The judge will decide. Your job is to present your client's case to the best of your ability. Now, if you want complete autonomy as to what cases to do and what not to do, you would need to start your own firm. But if you are in a firm where you, there are certain values that you already subscribe to in that firm, then if, you are, if there's something about the case that you are uncomfortable about, be very clear what is it that you are uncomfortable about. You know, because if you're making a judgment call, then it's not your place to do so. But if, if you're uncomfortable because, for example, the client is extremely aggressive towards you, that's a personal thing and you must take it up with your, uh, your boss. Because your boss, I mean, we have had situations like that where the, our lawyers were not comfortable with a particular client. We moved it on to another uh, lawyer in the firm. So it was just some, some issue that the, the lawyer was not comfortable with that particular client. And so as partners or as bosses in a firm, we always see what is the right fit, what is the best fit. But if it's something, your question was, it is, it's a moral issue. Now, you need to really be very clear and articulate what that moral issue is. Because if it's a personal thing, then you may need to get over it because you are there to serve your clients. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question because oftentimes it really goes on a case by case basis. You need to see what's actually, what is your issue and what is the matter about. Um, you cannot decide that the client, I mean, if it's a criminal matter, it's not your job to decide whether the client is guilty or not guilty. And I'm sure your lecturers have gone through this already. Very, very important because a lot of students, a lot of chambers, a lot of interns, you're not sure what your role is as a lawyer. Be very, very clear what your role. You are the spokesperson of your client, one. Number two, you are also an officer of the court. You cannot do anything to deceive the court or keep uh, information from the court. You have to provide the judge with everything in order for the judge to make the right decision, even authorities that are against you. That is your job. So 
so you need to really be clear about that um, thing. I hope, I hope that answers your question. All right, so our next question is from Edward Lam. Uh, he asked, uh, what are the downsides in practicing family law? Well, Edward, I don't think there's any downside in practicing family law. I guess um, the law practice is all very similar, no matter what type or what kind of, or what nature of cases that you actually take. I guess if you really want to talk about a downside, perhaps, um, as I, I think as what Datin has uh, shared earlier, um, is the emotions. Um, you, can, you can tend to be very emotional at times. I mean, but after years of practice, if you can, you know how to separate the emotions, then I guess everything will be fine. And I don't see that, that as, a, as a downside anymore. But if at all, that will only be uh, one area of, of downside. I say, you better call downside in practicing family law. Other than that, I don't see how, how is it going to affect. Yeah. I think a point that Gun mentioned earlier is a very important point to note, which is even in family law, you will be uh, dealing with bankruptcy law, you'll be dealing with criminal law, you'll be dealing with committal proceedings, you'll be dealing with um, even corporate matters. I mean, if your clients are actually business owners, you'll be dealing with all of that as well. So I would say that there's, there's not much downside to family law because you're not quite pigeonholed. Though you're doing family law, it is a very broad area of law. Unless you decide, I'm only going to do joint petitions, that's it then you're not going to learn very much. But if you you're open to learning, you will learn about many, many different areas of law. If you're doing, I mean, which, which has happened and, and um, even especially in Australia, you know, the family law courts are very much uh, involved with the bankruptcy proceedings, corporate proceedings, everything. They still will be the final arbiter. They have great powers much greater powers than even here in Malaysia. So as a family law practitioner, you need to know, how do I, I mean, how do I actually read this? Uh, we've had to do uh, forensic accounting, investigative accounting procedures just to find out where the, one of the partners in the business hit the money because that was also part of the family law proceedings. So, I think it's, it's a very interesting area of law. Now, I don't only practice family law, but I would say family law is a very interesting area of law because it covers so many areas. In Malaysia, even more interesting because you have the Sharia law as well. So as a firm, we have very good relations. We keep very good relations with, with excellent Sharia law practitioners because sometimes that will be an issue that crops up and you need to be able to deal with it. So. No, I think it's fascinating. So uh, give it a go if this is what you want to do. Okay, so our next question is from Liz De Cruz. Um, she's asking if uh, are ADR methods concerning family matters more prevalent in Malaysia? And have you personally experienced with it? And if you would recommend ADR uh, over litigation to clients. So I think what she's trying to say here is um, in Malaysia is ADR more prevalent compared to litigation and which would you recommend? I would say, um, I think before we can even proceed with the divorce petition, um, there is a requirement that um, parties will need to go for a, recon a reconciliation session uh, before you can actually proceed with the the divorce petition. Um, if you asking whether is it uh, prevalent, yes, you can try. I mean, there are the uh, mediators to uh, mediators to help the parties to see whether they can actually uh, come to a common ground or whether they can resolve any of their issues. But I think um, in situation like this, it's not so much more. If if party starts to look for lawyers, it's no longer about it's no longer about ADR, but I think, I think if, if they really want to, to resolve their issues, they should really go and seek a uh, family counsellor. Uh, maybe they tend to uh, be 
something between uh, in their relationship that tends to not work anymore. So yes, um, we have that. We have that. We have that avenue uh, for parties to actually look into it. Is it prevalent? But uh, as I said, if they tend to look for lawyers, most likely um, they are heading for divorce and they have already made up their mind. So, yeah, that's right. And uh, yes, in Malaysia, while reconciliation proceedings, I mean, you actually have to go through that. But remember, the people who are actually on that board or body are not professional counsellors. So I, every client that comes to me with a family law matter, I send them for counselling first because they need to know that this is what they want. They're very clear that this is what they want. Because there are also there are things that I cannot assist them with and that would, is best for a professional counsellor to do that. Now, once they've come to that decision, um, comparing uh, Australian law with Malaysian law, in Australian law, one of the pre-action procedures is counselling. It's mandated. You have to go through mandated relationship counselling, especially when the issues involve children, when there are parenting orders being um, that, are, that are being asked for then the parties must go through uh, the mediation proceedings, all right? So uh, even here in Malaysia, it is also a requirement, but um, it, it is always best to have mediators who know what they're doing because at the end of the day, you don't want an issue where their parties are being forced into positions that, and they have not been able to um, speak about their issues fully. And the mediation process is to allow people to vent their emotions, able to get that out of the way and actually then decide on the main issues that they need to resolve, that a court order needs to be put in place for. So I would say that it can help if you have good counts, uh, good mediators, somebody's people who know what they're doing, right? So, and that is a requirement. In Australia, people are, they are professionally trained to do that. In Malaysia, sometimes it's the luck of the draw. You have to decide, right? You, you, you need to decide who, um, who, and if you can get the parties to agree, that, that itself is a huge, huge step, getting the parties to agree to go for that, all right? So I would say um, if you have competent lawyers, then sometimes be coming before the judge is, it's just that it takes longer. Mediation is a shorter process. That's one thing that is that's an advantage. It's a shorter process. Okay. All right. So the next question is directed uh, towards Datin Yon. Uh, it's from Indu. Uh, she says, good morning. Currently, I'm a year two UOL student. I am keen to know more on uh, Australian law. Also, other any possibilities to practice in Australia? Um, yeah, of course there are possibilities to practice in Australia, but you need to be admitted to the Australian bar. So let me answer the questions in relation to Australia. I was going to touch on this. What's the difference between practicing in Australia? How do you become a practitioner in Australia? And you know what, um, how do you go about it? So number one, clients are the same everywhere, all right? So clients in Australia are the same as clients over here. It doesn't matter. They have the same issues, they have the same problems. One thing I would say though, clients there are much more uh, savvy if with regards to their rights. So uh, a lot of things, we have a lot of, uh, in family law particularly, there are a lot of self-represented litigants. So they will represent themselves, they file their own affidavits, etc. And the judges do take the time to listen and hear them out. So that's a good thing about, about um, the uh, jurisdiction there. Um, the courts are also more advanced um, in technology. So I, I'm thankful that Malaysia, we are, we are leveling up as well. So, um, and over there, the profession is very clearly divided. You are either a solicitor or a barrister, even though when you are admitted, you're called to the bar, you are a called, uh, I, I was admitted as a solicitor and barrister um, there. In, in Malaysia, of course, it's a fused profession, but over there is very clearly bifurcated. So you decide uh, three to four years or whatever, or almost immediately whether you want to just practice at the bar, meaning be a barrister only. And so, so over there, um, 
I even practice uh, criminal law, which I don't do here. Because over there, whatever area that you're practicing in, there will usually be two legal representatives. One is the instructing solicitor. So this is what you would see mainly in UK law uh, shows, you know, uh, it, you'll have the instructing solicitor who does a lot of all the legwork, you meet the clients, you do all of that. But when it comes to the court proceedings, there will be a barrister who represents uh, the client. Okay, so it is very clearly divided there. Um, so how do you become a practitioner in Australia if you are called to the Malaysian bar? You can't, uh, you, you can do it by, your qualifications need to be assessed in order to see whether you can practice in Australia, your qualifications need to be assessed. I mean, I only uh, decided to practice in Australia after 15 years here in Malaysia. So I only needed to do four subjects and that was it. And, and, um, <laughs> and this is after an appeal because they, they required me to do company law, even though I have a master's in, com in, 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 in commercial law and company law, and I had to appeal. So it, they brought it down to four. So thankfully, because um, for example, land law is different. Land law is very different in Australia to here. Um, so there were four areas that they felt okay because my practice in Malaysian law would not have exposed me to that. We, I just had to do that and then I was admitted. So you may have to do that as well. You just need to submit your qualifications for assessment by the practice. Now, bear in mind in Australia, all the states have got their own legal practitioners board. Unlike here in Malaysia, where it is one federal bo body that governs all lawyers in Peninsula Malaysia and one uh, for Sabah and Sarawak, I believe. So, for, so we are under the Malaysian Bar Council here. And so, um, and everything to do with our profession is governed by mainly by them, of course, the legal profession act and then the regulations. So over there, every state has got its own legal practitioners board. So if you decide you want to practice in WA Western Australia, for example, you would go and get your qualifications assessed by the board there. And they will then tell you, okay, fine, you are exempted from doing these subjects, you only need to do these, and then you can do that. You either go there and study at the university or you do distance learning. So there are a lot of various options. And once you've completed that, you then need to do, uh, at this point in time, I believe you need to do um, restricted, what do you call it? You need to do, it's like our CLP here. So it's quite a long process now. It wasn't for me because I was already a practitioner for so many years, so they exempt you. So if you have the practical, so if you want to go and practice in Australia, maybe after five years, with some kind of uh, practical uh, training behind you, then it would be better to apply. Otherwise, it is quite a lengthy process, I would say. Um, the other thing about practice of law there is, obviously, it's in English, okay? So you need to be competent in English, even though your clients come from all different backgrounds and may speak English in the very heavily accented from depending on their background, you do need to practice, you, you are submitting in English, everything is in English. But if you are, you are very good with technology here, you will also do very well there because a lot of our work is online. A lot of our submissions, everything is done online, okay? Yeah, that's it. All right. So the next question is um, open to both speakers. Uh, it's from Jomin uh, Lim. She asked that um, would be would we be able to practice family law even if we don't uh, take the subject in year two? So just to give a bit of context to this question. So in year two, we are faced with a choice uh, between generally company and family law, uh, and most people go for company because it at face value appears to be the more practical choice um, so even if you some people who uh, like family they just go with company anyway so uh, not many are taking family even i think from my own experience i think there was only like 20 or less people in my class from what i know um, so in that sense, not does not taking the subject in year two really affect um, your progress when you actually decide to um, become a family lawyer? 
Okay, uh, that this is something I can really relate to. Um, the reason being, I didn't take uh, I didn't take company law, but I'm doing a lot of corporate litigation now. <laughs> so the short question to this is: uh, Are you able to practice family law even if you don't take the subject? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. In in, in Malaysia context. And it's the same in uh, Australia as well. So yes, definitely a big yes. Don't worry if you haven't taken family law and then you go out there and decide, wow, I really want to try my hand at this. Go ahead because you will learn far, far more in practice than you are learning right now. I think on probably five or 10% of what you learn and what you're going to you know, be doing out there, um, there are a lot of things that are basic things that you really need to know because it covers every area of law, every specialization, right? Which is why you learn that in your first year. So, so even though you, you don't do corporate law or you don't do criminal law really well, when you go out there and you want to try it out, you will learn far more just doing it and being in the company of people who are doing it really well. Okay, you learn far more from that than what you're learning in your textbooks and in your lectures now. So don't worry about it. Okay, so our next question is from Ching Leong. Uh, uh, she asks, um, how do you maintain professionalism with clients and not offer any personal advice uh, when it's clear that the legal action is not the solution that they are looking for? I think you have to be entirely upfront with your client from the very beginning. That's why I said one of the most important questions you ask your client is what do they want? If you're not clear what your client wants, how on earth are you going to help them get a resolution? So for them to come to the point of articulating what they want is you asking them, what do you want? What will you be happy with? What outcome can you live with? Once they are clear about that, then, you know, you may, if you get something better than that, of course, they'll be happy. But you know that that is kind of the baseline. They want that. So in, in answering your question about whether if the client cannot get that, that result, and let me say, only if you are certain that the client cannot get that result, please don't upfront say, oh, cannot. You really need to do your research, find out for sure. If the client cannot get that result, then be upfront with them and tell them, no, you can't get this. Now, um, because I'm the kind of person I am, I tend to offer advice to my clients. Um, but I always say, look, I'm just telling you this as a friend. I'm not as your lawyer. As your lawyer, I will tell you one, two, three. So I make that very clear. One, two, three, as a lawyer, do this, this, this. But as a friend, this is going to drain your resources. It is going to cost you a lot of emotional grief and you may not get the outcome that you want. So the decision is yours. Remember that if you always give the ball back to the client, it's their life, it's their liberty, it's their issues, hand it back to them and ask them, what is your decision? And with some clients, you better get it in writing. In fact, with most, all right? Because they'll forget that they, they wanted that from you, okay? All right, yeah, I, I'm total agreement with Datin, yes. Um, if you are very sure that um, there's no solution or you shouldn't litigate, just tell them up front. And if you're not sure, do some research and then upon getting the answers, tell them uh, what's the, uh, what's the solution? If still um, cannot go to court, tell them straightforward. And um, if it's my friend, of course, again, um, issue of cost will always uh, be at the forefront. Going for litigation um, definitely involves a lot of money. It's not really cheap in a way. So you have to let them know that. And not just because uh, they're your friend and they just say, okay, you just fight for me no matter what. And this can always be an issue. So let, tell them, tell them upfront every time. Don't, uh, don't try to hide anything. And also, yes, um, always put it, everything in writing. You do not want one day they, they come back to you, right? All right, so our next question is from Grace Wong. Hi speakers, I'm wondering what are the things you wish that you, that you knew uh, 
earlier when you first started your law career. It's my final year before I start my chambering next year. Dati, maybe you want to take this first? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had um, done more internship. I wish I'd worked in a legal firm. So I think, I think with BAC, you, you do uh, uh, encourage your students to do so, but I never did. You know, I worked throughout my, I put myself through law school. So I worked, but I wasn't working in a legal firm. I know that if I had worked in a legal firm, I would have learned so much that would have helped me in my studies, that would have helped me in my CLP, that would have helped me in everything that I did. So I, I wish I had done that. So if, the, if there's one thing I could go back and redo, I would do that, not work in where I was working, but work in a legal firm. Because you learn, and especially if you can work in a smaller to mid-sized firm, you will learn more. Um, in a bigger firm, you... You tend to, you tend to get a very small area to, you know, to learn in. Whereas in a in a small to mid-sized firm, you learn everything because you're exposed to everything. So I would encourage you if you haven't done it yet, find a firm that you can spend some time in. And you know what? It's you who wants the experience. So don't think about how much am I being paid because actually the firm is giving up their time to teach you so that you cannot, you know, you cannot be uh, repaid in, in money or whatever. So do that. If you can do that, you'll learn a lot. All right. For me, things uh, I wish I could have known earlier would be, um, so I shared just now, I think I sh if I can redo, I would want to take company law <laughs> instead of following it. <laughs> I think yeah yeah that's that's one of the one of it uh, which is also the main one. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I must say the other thing um, during my chambering. So this happened during my chambering. I was there were five partners in the firm, and one was hand, one was doing litigation, and I was, you know, I was cherry picked to go into litigation very fast because the partner liked the research and everything that I'd done. So. I think if you can, if you have a choice, try out different areas because there were areas of law that I, I was not exposed to because I did not, um, I was too quickly streamlined. Yeah. So that's another thing you want to consider. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from C. Yen Kuang. Uh, he says, Morning, may I know basically new junior lawyer will get what job area from firm to do when beginning? So CN, it depends on the firm. Every firm has a different way. Some have very uh, regulated. Okay, if you're a new lawyer, this is what you go through this for how many months and then you go through this department, this department. So every uh, firm is different. So I, there's no standard thing, but you definitely won't be exposed to any major matters you know the firm will always want to try out in smaller cases smaller matters first see where you go and then expose you to the bigger bigger clients bigger files yeah yeah I, i'm in agreement um there's no one size fit all um if you're in a smaller firm of course you will technically do everything if you are in a bigger firm and bigger firms usually they have teams uh, they work in teams so if you are being employed by a particular partner and maybe that particular partner is doing a lot of uh, corporate litigation, then perhaps um, you are only doing corporate litigation. So yes, it really depends on the firm and also the size of the firm. Our next question is from Angeline Chu. She says, thank you for all the valuable input. My question will be, um, why Mr. Gan and Datin Yuan yourself will choose um, being a lawyer as your profession? What will be the few things um, that bring you great satisfaction during your practice? Okay. Uh, let me say that I chose this because this was the option open for me. It was not something that I had dreamed of as a young girl. I must be a lawyer. I was the first lawyer in my family. And after I became a lawyer, 
my my nephew, my nieces, we have so many lawyers now, but I was the first lawyer in my family. So there were very few people I could ask about how to become a lawyer, but that was the, the option that was open to me at the time. But I, want, what I do want to say the, though, that I don't regret it at all. I mean, I'm thankful that this is where I was directed. I'm thankful that this is where I was led to do. Uh, this is the profession that I'm in because the law opens many, many doors, many avenues for you, many. So what brings me greatest satisfaction is um, my clients. You know, when I engage with them, when I find that they are happy with the work that I've done and and I want to say that for me, the greatest, greatest satisfaction is seeing my clients' lives after, after the case, when I, I've done a good job for them and they are happy. And, you know, we continue, like I said, my clients become my friends. Most of them are lifelong friends, you know, from 30 years ago. We're still friends to this day. So that brings me satisfaction, knowing that I've done my best, I've given it my, my best, and that's and, and that my clients know that I've done my best and that that outcome is something that they are happy with. So I'm, I'm glad of that. I'm just, I'm thankful to be able to do that. All right. Um, in, in polar opposite from Datin, I chose this for Datin. Yeah, it's something that I wanted to do since young. So I had the opportunity and I grabbed it. So yeah, so here I am. And satisfaction, I guess the, the kind of long hours you put into a case, the kind of research and after you, you do from, from A to Z, the whole matter and taking control of the file, um, winning in hearings, I think, I think that, that kind of satisfaction and, and you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, judgment is in your favor. I think that satisfaction is something that you cannot buy with money. And that is what brings me that kind of satisfaction, even after I'm putting up um, late nights. And that g gave me that kind of satisfaction. If I know at the end of the day, I won the case. Yeah, that's the kind of satis that satisfaction for me. Um, so Hannah Cassandra asks, in your personal journey as a lawyer, which case moved you uh, into focusing uh, into family law more? Like I said, the first case that walked in that door that had a family law matter was assigned to me. So I did it. And it was an extremely emotional journey, but a hard won victory. I'm so thankful for it. Um, but I learned so much. And actually from that case, I started giving um, a lot of talks uh, with the women's organizations, um, helping out with family violence. I got into the committee uh, in the Ministry of Family Law and Development to change the laws on domestic violence. So I got to meet a lot of people who um, who face these kind of issues every day, you know, uh, violence in their home. And so I, I am not, uh, I, I must say, I'm not, a, um, I, not, I don't only do family law. Family law is one of the areas that I specialize in, but I don't only do family law. But that was the case that moved me into that was, this, that when I met that client and then I started doing legal aid cases for all these um, uh, victims of uh, domestic violence and you just started learning so much more about it and how we as lawyers have the ability to change somebody's life. We really have that ability because they can't speak for themselves in our courts here. Uh, they find it, they would find it very difficult too because it's, you know, they can't even do the papers and all that, but we can do that. And to see, uh, you know, to see somebody's life completely turned around because you were there to help them, that I think is, it's just amazing. It's a gift, you know. So, so this thing that you're doing, like I said, it is not a career, it's a calling. It's a calling where you are given the ability to change somebody else's life. Just because you have the skill, you have the training, you can speak for them. So if you view it that way, you will find personal satisfaction in your career. Yeah, for me, um, my focus was mainly in criminal law uh, at the early, uh, early stage of my practice. Um, 
I came about uh, family law uh, after I was handled uh, down with a matter on an annulment matter. And slowly from there, then I, I took up family law and uh, doing uh, the other petitions. But just like also um, Datin, definitely family law is not only what I'm focusing, I, I'm doing uh, other areas of law too. Um, I think uh, for a middle size uh, law firm, I think gen generally uh, lawyers uh, tend to do uh, a myriad of, uh, of practice or of, of cases or law rather than just focusing on one area. So the next question is from Bethany Chu. How would you, uh, what would you do when a client comes to you but you don't have knowledge and experience in that particular area or field? So I touched on this earlier. Uh, so right now, if you're studying, make sure that you make good friends, right? Because it may not be your area of expertise, but it could be somebody else's area of expertise. Um, you can, you need to connect with people who know that area. If you feel that you cannot do it, then at all, I mean, and that you don't think you can get up to speed with the information that you need, because say it's a very urgent matter, um, bring a more senior counsel on board. That's another thing that you can do because as you, when you bring a more senior counsel on board, it is a learning process for you too. You will learn how to do this, right? Because you will do all the legwork, but then seeing that senior counsel submit, how they do it, how, what are the issues that they um, uh, zero in on, it'll be a learning experience for you. So when the next case comes, which is in this area, you may be able to do it on your own. So that's one thing you could do. But if you absolutely cannot bring another counsel on board and you cannot, you don't have the experience and you can't get up to speed in time to fully represent your client, then don't take the case. Tell your client, I can't do this. Let me recommend you to somebody else. Okay. Right. Um, I agree with that thing. Um, let's say um, if you have this problem, and try asking around to see if anyone can actually offer you the advice first. If none is willing to do so, then try to get yes, um, maybe another lawyer to work together with you, or perhaps a, a counsel. And if still no hope, then just uh, reject or decline the brief and get the client uh, to find someone else with the knowledge and experience. Okay, so our next question if, is from Yi Yun Wei. Um, hi, Mr. Gan and Dr. Yuan. Thanks for all the information. I'm currently a CLP candidate. I'm wondering what are the people able to be exposed to uh, in every area of practice during pupillage? So I guess, um, uh, is it possible to be exposed to every area or at least most of the areas of law during pupillage? <laughs> what do you think, Dave? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's definitely no. You, you, you are not able to go. Right. You only because it's such a short time. Pupillage is only nine months. There's so much to learn. So, yeah, it's just a starting point. All right. So, the next question is from Narita. Um, in Malaysia, in court, is it a must to speak Basim Layu or can we use English as well? Uh, the lower courts tend to use uh, Bahasa Melayu, but of course, um, can ask permission to submit or to speak in English. But the high courts and above, uh, high courts, courts of, court of appeal, and also the federal court, um, can use English. Um, so no, that's not a problem. But of um, course, most papers, we all have to drop it in uh, Bahasa Melayu. Sorry, um, I just want to go back to Yi Yun Wee's question. I didn't mean to make light of it. I just want to tell you that in your during your pupillage, you will be exposed to different areas of law depending on which firm you go to. But it is highly unlikely that you can be exposed to every area. 
if there is, if right now, if there is already an area of law that you're keen on doing and you're keen to go deeper into, choose a firm that does that, that specializes in that area. Then you know that you will be exposed to already an area that you are keen on doing. But like both uh, Gan and I caution, try not to, you know, specialize into something so soon because you can learn so much, you know, there's so much that you can, something, another area that you may find, wow, this is something I really wanted to do. I never knew I would be interested in it. So, you know, like, like we both said, you cannot be exposed to every area of law, but yeah, um, choose a firm that if you are already clear what you want to do, choose a firm that specializes in that area. And with regards to Basa Melayu and English, yes, ask permission. Most of the time we start out the first sentence or whatever is in Bahasa, then we ask permission to speak in English because most of our judges in the higher courts are educated in English anyway. They are much more comfortable uh, when you submit in English, although they are very proficient in Bahasa. So yeah, just ask permission. Um, so, Jomin Lim asked if there's any fun cases um, you've experienced that you can share with us. <laughs> okay, maybe I can start first. This is not, uh, not my personal uh, case, something that I observed in court while I was in court. So I saw this um, very senior lawyer uh, bringing a lot of law books um, as if there was a hearing going on, like the, there's this lengthy submission going on. So when his case was called, all he did was, uh, he's asking for an adjournment. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so I, was, I was so puzzled why he was arranging all his law books and, and yeah, as if there was going to be a, a lengthy submission or, or trial going on. When in fact, he was all he's doing is just asking for an adjournment of the case. Yeah, so that's one of the very funny moments that, that I've seen in court. Yeah, well, I can't recall any fun cases. I mean, there are fun moments. There are very few fun cases. You know, most of this is a very serious matter. People don't come and see lawyers unless it's a very serious issue. So uh, we've had a lot of funny moments along the way. But yeah, no, I, I don't think nothing comes to mind. But um, yeah, it's, it's just that it's an interesting profession you've chosen you know and you you will you will just learn so many things along the way yeah all right i think that was our last question um to both of our speakers do you have any closing remarks um Yes, I think, I think just to summarize, I, I believe um, just do well in your LLB and um, again, um, just take away, uh, if you have free time, go and do internships uh, with or without pay, just go and do it. At least get some form of experience. At least when you do your pupillage, you, 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 you have to feel that, you know what is it going on uh, or the workings in the law firm. And and I, I believe uh, many uh, budding lawyers, um, what they look for would be maybe in terms of salary. Maybe uh, the first few years, maybe it's a bit difficult. Um, doesn't matter. Do it first. Um, I mean, at least enough to uh, support your, your monthly expenses. Yeah, just go and do it first. I mean, if you really like that firm, even though it's offering uh, not really a high pay, I mean, just do it first. Uh, gain the experience that you can and then from with the experience um, you can maybe get maybe you would tend to open up your own law firm or you can maybe um, jump to another law firm so so with the experience yeah experience is very very important and uh, i believe that's what a lot of our law firms are, are looking at and um, just a sort of like a closing remark from from me um, um, the firm here, actually, uh, we have uh, monthly um, webinars. Um, if any of the pupils or, or students here would like to see, you can log into the website and check out uh, when, uh, when is our next uh, talk. Excellent. Yeah, so um, parting words. 
I would say one, don't worry too much about how to, uh, you know, whether you'll be prepared to go into this area of law, that area of law, give it a go. All right. It's an expression we use in Australia a lot. Just give it a go. Just try it out. Um, the, the second thing is do everything with all your heart. Don't do half measures, all right? If you're going to do something, give it your 120%. There's no such thing, but, you know, just give it everything. Because when you do, then you will be satisfied that you've done your uttermost, you know, you've done your uttermost. And that, I mean, even in your studies. So in your studies, in, you know, hanging out with friends, make this time, I mean, your college time, your CLP time, something that you remember. Instead of always looking at, Oh, when I finish my law, then I will do. Oh, when I finish CLP, then, you know, when you go out there, it'll be, oh, when I finish my chambering. Oh, when I finish seven years in law, then I can have my first chambering student. It's <laughs> stop thinking of the next thing and the next thing and the next goalpost. Enjoy right now what you're doing. So enjoy your studies and, and um, enjoy your studies because there's so much for you guys to look forward to. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much to Mr. Gunn and Dr. Yuan for taking the time to actually um, uh, do this talk for us. I think it really helped a lot of us um, decide um, what we want to do and uh, sort of get an insight of what law actually is all about in the working, in the working world. Um, as for everyone else who attended this event, thank you so much for coming. Do try to stay because we have another corporate talk. Uh, at one o'clock. So if possible, if you guys could attend that, that would be really great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Gan. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave.